episode of Playbill 2.0. So if you're paying attention to the quote last time, uh, it went a little something like this. Many a man before you in his dreams hath shared his mother's bed. And for those of you who ever may or may not have paid attention during high school English, the play that I'm discussing this week is You Got It, Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. Oedipus Rex, for those of you who don't know, in English means Oedipus the King. I don't know about you guys, but I had to read it once sophomore year English, once in my senior year of English, uh, twice my freshman year of college, and we'll see how many more times I have to read it uh, in the future. A little bit about the history of Oedipus Rex first. Like I said, uh, the version we'll be discussing is by Sophocles. However, there were approximately seven or eight different versions of the story itself because before it was a play, it was a myth. The first time that Oedipus Rex was ever performed was in 429 BC. Uh, the writer, Sophocles, was one of the most successful playwrights of his time, even though only seven of his plays, one being Oedipus Rex, survived until modern times in full versions. It's estimated that he wrote approximately 123 other plays and in the 30-something competitions that he took place that he took part in as far as playwriting goes, he won almost all of them and anything that he didn't win he got second place. Sophocles also introduced for the first time the third actor in a play, which is hard to tell that there were only three actors if you read Oedipus Rex because there are like a dozen characters, but if you pay attention, there's never more than three people on stage talking. Back in Greek times, they didn't have costumes, they would just have, for the most part, these huge elaborate masks so that the spectators, which were sitting, for the most part, if you were common or especially really far away, they could see some form of facial expression. Um, and so anyway, these actors would just run backstage and change masks really quick before they had to come on. If you pay attention to any Greek plays you read, you never see an actor die on stage because it, once they die, it's, unless you move them, you can only have two actors. So you always hear about deaths that occur off stage from other people. Anyway, backstory. So, when Oedipus, before Oedipus was born, even, going way back, his parents uh, were told this prophecy that Oedipus would kill his father and marry his mother. And so to prevent this, they, t ha they gave their baby to a shepherd who took him into the mountains and left him to die. However, baby Oedipus was found by another shepherd and was taken to the palace of King Laius in another land far away from Thebes. And Laius uh, raised him as his own son. Eventually Oedipus heard the prophecy about how he would kill his father and marry his mother. And Laius and his wife had never told Oedipus that he was adopted, I guess. So Oedipus flees the country that his adoptive father rules over, he's walking along kind of on this journey, and he comes to this crossroads, crossroads where he encounters a very wealthy man and a bunch of his guards. And at that point, um, they get into a fight because of this whole issue about honor and who can go first and whatnot, and Oedipus ends up killing this wealthy man, who you find out later is his real father. Now, from then on, he continues further on his journey, he comes across Thebes, which is being guarded by a Sphinx. And the Sphinx um, is, will, kill, will not let anyone leave or enter the city unless they can answer a riddle. And so she p gives this riddle to Oedipus, and Oedipus figures it out, and so the Sphinx is like, goes nuts, and she goes up and kills herself. Because the town of Thebes is so grateful, they make Oedipus king, because, um, also because their king is dead. Oedipus killed him, but they don't know that. And so Oedipus marries the queen, which is his mother, Jocasta. The um, actual play Oedipus Rex by Sophocles opens with Thebes is suffering this terrible plague, and Oedipus is promising that he's going to figure out how to stop it. I will find out why there was a plague. And he has sent his, um, what do you call it, brother in law, Creon, to the oracles at Delphi to see if they can tell him why there's this horrible plague. And Creon gets back and tells Oedipus, well, it's because we have this uh, abomination in our town. And this abomination kills our king. Um, Oedipus, not knowing that he um, is this abomination that has killed the king, the former king, uh, swears that he will find out this person and banish him from the town and then everything will be good to go. 
So he's trying to figure things out, and eventually he summons Tiresias, who is this creepy little foreign guy, who also is an oracle. I may be blind, but I know things. And he asks him, do you know, do the almighty powers that be tell you who this abomination is that we need to get rid of? And Tiresias knows that it's Oedipus. But basically Tiresias says, I don't want to tell you because you're going to be really upset. Dude, trust me, you don't want to know, okay? And so Oedipus is like, um, excuse me, like, please tell me who it is. I want to know things that are bad for me to know! So while Tiresias and Oedipus are having this argument, eventually Tiresias is so upset that he says, you're the murderer, you did it, it's your fault that there's a plan. Murderer! And again, Oedipus is like, um, what? That's ridiculous. Oedipus uh, t ends up going and talking to his wife, Jocasta, slash his mom. She says, oh, you know, you should have listened to prophets a long time ago. Uh, my former husband and I received this oracle that our son would kill him, but um, my, my husband was killed by bandits a long time ago it, on this crossroads. And Oedipus is like, crossroads? What? And then suddenly worries that maybe he's a bandit, which he was. And so she, and then she, Jocasta says, well, there was one survivor and it was a servant of my husband. So he's talking to the servant and he's questioning him. And through some complicated form of events, uh, Oedipus decides he needs to talk to this shepherd, who was the shepherd that took him and left him on the rocks to die. Jocasta, meanwhile, while Oedipus is talking to all these people trying to figure out what's going on, figures things out and realizes that she is married to her son. <laughs> And she tells him, like, no, you don't want to know, just stop questioning people, and he's like, dude, I'm this close. So, Oedipus keeps questioning all these people, and then figures out, oh my god, I'm married to my mom, and that was me that killed Laius, who is actually my real dad. <laughs> so, he runs in after Jocasta, who has in the meantime left and gone off like her bedroom. And then you find out through hearsay, because remember, no one ever dies on stage in a great play, that Jocasta has hung herself in her bedroom. And Oedipus goes in and finds her and is like, oh my god, she's dead. And then decides that for punishment, he's going to blind himself. So he takes out these um, ceremonial pins on Jocasta's outfit and uses them to stab out his eyes. So there's a lot of symbolism that you can tell in this play with tree, uh, Oedipus was blind to the truth and then by the end actually blind, all kinds of fun stuff. Aristotle, who was a big philosopher of his time, used Oedipus as the pinnacle when describing what a tragedy and what drama should be in, in the Greek theater. He described Oedipus Rex as the pinnacle of Greek tragedy and tragedy in general. Also, um, there's a lot of state and interesting stuff going on in this play. Um, many uh, writers and um, professors and scholars and critics who work with dramatic literature believe that you can no longer have a tragedy like Oedipus because in our society we believe in willpower and the will and making our own choices and that there is no fate. For the most part, I'm not going to like put that boss out as everybody's, but that's what a lot of people believe. Whereas in Greek, uh, Greek times, everything was fate and so Fate is so interwoven with tragedy, you can no longer write a real tragedy anymore because we don't believe in fate the way we used to. Well, viewers, that's it for this episode of Playbill 2.0. Hope you had a good time learning about the terrors of being an abomination and sleeping with your mom. And in case you were wondering, yes, I did change my outfit because my camera stopped working yesterday and I had to finish the episode today. <laughs>